All right, hopefully my voice um, holds up. Yesterday was okay. I, was, I went soul winning yesterday with um, Michael Reyes and got to talk a bit, <coughs> got to preach the gospel to somebody, a lady that was brought up as a Catholic. But um, I guess I had, the, I had the low sexy voice yesterday and now it's just like gone. <laughs> so using too much sexy voice yesterday. Um, all right, so let's, uh, before I go into the sermon, um, just remember that um, 26th of January is Australia Day. So if you are not doing anything on Australia Day, we're going to have a barbecue at our place, sort of do a BYO meet. Um, I think Nathan's going to bring like a bigger barbecue. So if, you're, if you haven't got anything to do on that day, that's the 26th of um, January. Then <coughs> our church anniversary is the 1st of March. So the 3rd of March is going to be a Saturday. So we're going to have a bowling event on that day. Um, I'll try and load all these things into TMAP over the next uh, couple of days. So try and keep that day free if you can. That's the 3rd of March. <clears throat> and then the 4th of March uh, will be Anniversary Sunday. So we'll, we'll take a big group photo. So hopefully all of you guys will be there to take a group photo on um, Anniversary Sunday. And then on um, Easter, which is going to be the weekend of the 31st <coughs> of, um, of March, um, it, we might have something at our place as well. Maybe we'll do like a, um, I don't know, Nathan and I have been talking, like, I don't know, we're going to do like a pig on a spit or a, I want to do a lamb on a spit. I thought a lamb on a spit would be cool for Easter. So I'm looking at you, Peter. <laughs> Make that happen. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so today I want to preach, <clears throat> let's go to Leviticus 27. Today I'm going to preach on the law of tithing. So I know, I know money is always a touchy topic for people, you know, I think it's obviously because there's so many scams out there and there's so many people out there that after your money and, and all that sort of stuff that people get a sour taste in their mouth because a lot of people are out there trying to get people's money. But, you know, it's, it's, it's something in the Bible, you know, giving to the Lord, you know, obviously any charity um, needs money in order to run and same in our church. But that's not the reason why I'm preaching this sermon, right? Because... <clears throat> Um, we're doing all right financially, you guys who are in the Facebook group, you know how much is in the bank account and whatnot. So that's not the purpose of this sermon. Um, it's just that I've never really preached a sermon specifically on giving and tithing. You know, I know I've always mentioned it throughout the years. So those of you who know, I don't really preach on this at all. You know, this church has been going for almost three years now. And I've always wanted to sort of preach a topic, preach a sermon just on this topic. And I thought, you know, I haven't done it in a while, so... Um, I'll, I'll just give you my thoughts here. And, <clears throat> and what I believe about the law of tithing and how it applies or doesn't apply in the New Testament and it's instead what is replaced. But probably next week I'll go into actual principles of New Testament giving. But today I want to talk about why I believe the law of tithing as it is generally preached today and believed is not applicable in the New Testament and there's actually a, a higher level or a higher standard um, in terms principle wise of giving in the New Testament and it's a, it's a totally different mindset. So today we'll just be about <clears throat> the law of tithing. So first of all let's go to Leviticus <clears throat> 27 and we'll read from verse 30 um, and we'll just look at what the tithe is. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. And if a man will at all redeem all of his tithes, <clears throat> he shall add there to the fifth part thereof. So it seems like if you want to buy back your tithes after you've given it to the Levites, <clears throat> you have to pay 20% more to get it back. Which is interesting. I don't know who would ever want to do that unless it was easier than growing more yourself in certain situations. And concerning the tithe of the herd or of the flock, even of whatsoever passeth under the rod, <clears throat> the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. So that's where we learn, and, and this is not the only passage where we see people are wondering, you know, what is the tithe? The tithe is basically just a tenth of, of your increase, right? A tenth of, and that's where people get this idea that you give 10% to church because they think of the tithe as 10% to the Levitical priesthood. And, and that's where they get that, that teaching from. He shall not search whether it be good or bad, neither how she, um, shall he change it. And if he change it at all, then both it and the change thereof shall be holy. It shall not be redeemed. 
These are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the children of Israel in Mount Sinai. So first of all, we can see that uh, the tithe is a tenth. If we go to Deuteronomy 14.22, we can see here um, that they were actually commanded to, uh, to tithe their tenth. And it was like the first tenth um, of their increase. Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed <clears throat> that the field bringeth forth year by year. Now, the question is sometimes asked of people <clears throat> who believe in tithing. They will ask, <clears throat> well, when we look at tithing in, in the Bible, in Deuteronomy, and we look in Leviticus, you'll notice here <clears throat> that a lot of people believe that the tithe is just a tithe of all your increase. So no matter what occupation you do, no matter what you do to earn money, 10% of that was, was the tithe, right? And you would give that to the Levites. Um, but then some people will say, well, but the tithe in the, in the Bible actually only mentions the tithe of the field, right? The tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, it is the Lord's. Um, or there's a tithe of the flock, right? The tithe of the herd, a tithe of the flock. Um, so generally, this, this, this topic comes up of if, if, you, like if, you're trying, if you believe in tithing and you're trying to calculate the tithe, is, is the tithe calculated of just all everyone's increase or is it only increase that comes from animals you know, reproducing and the land bringing forth fruit? Because you kind of think, well, back then, a lot of people might have had a lot of cattle or might have been farmers. But nowadays, a lot of people don't do that, right? A lot of people are not in primary industries. They're in secondary industries. Like, how many of us here are farmers or shepherds looking after animals? So it's like, am I meant, people, people are, the, the argument is basically, do, do I tithe? Because I don't have herds and I have animals. You know, I go to work and I get paid a salary. I'm in a tech business, right? So what has that got to do with, so does the tithe, um, <coughs> apply to people in secondary, secondary industries or only in primary industries. So people ask this question because they're trying to calculate, you know, how, you know, how, do you, how are you actually meant to calculate this, this um, tithe? And I guess the question is, if, if the tithe only applies to primary industries, then, then were people in secondary industries required to tithe? You know, so I don't, I don't, I don't 100% I wouldn't 100% agree, and, I, and honestly, I haven't figured all this out because I don't even believe tithing is applicable for the New Testament, so I haven't worked out all the ins and outs. It's, it's sort of like if you didn't have to pay taxes, you wouldn't really care about all the tax laws, but it's when you have to pay taxes, that's when you're trying to figure out all the tax laws and how you're meant to work that out and all that sort of stuff. So I haven't really gone really in depth on all the different scenarios, but if it only applies to the primary industries, if the people who are saying, well, it's only the tithe of the herd, it's only the tithe of the land, then people who are in secondary industries, for example, like if you don't, if you're not actually a shepherd, but what you do is you buy wool, right? And you make clothing and then you sell clothing. Is, are you meant to also tithe on the increase of your profits? You know, because you didn't actually have the tithe of the herd. You actually bought raw materials and then added value to it and then unsold it. So is that what the tithe is? Or is that you then are just required to give an offering, you know, out of your free will offerings and sin offerings and things like that, as opposed to the tithe being the first tenth of what the land or what animals, you know, reproduce. <clears throat> so <clears throat> let's say if somebody said, well, that's just the, the primary industries, I think, well, does that mean secondary industries people never give? Um, something to think about there. I haven't 100% um, thought it all the way through. But it, it would make sense to me that <clears throat> people will say, well, is the increase that people are meant to tithe on, is it, is it profit or revenue, right? Now, if, 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 the, la if the land is, if they're tithing on revenue, right, then I don't think that personally makes sense because if they're tithing on revenue, then the Levites will end up getting more than a tenth. Because let's say I'm a farmer and I get an increase of 100 sheep, right? I'm going to tithe 10%, which would be 10 sheep. But then if I also have employees, right, and that I pay them 10 sheep each, and let's say I have five employees, right, so they have 10 sheep each, and then they tithe on their increase, right, so they're going to tithe one sheep each, that means that the Levites are actually getting 15 sheep as opposed to 10 sheep, which would be the, the tithe of 100 sheep. 
So it makes sense to me that you know, they would be tithing on the profit, right? Kind of like today where we would have tax deductions, right? They would be tithing on the profit of their business, the deduction, whatever expenses and what profit they bring forward after they've paid their expenses. Um, they would be tithing on that. And then somebody who actually only brings forth 100 sheep, but he pays 50 sheep, he would tithe, you know, five, and then each of the employees would tithe five, and then the Levites would get that 10%. And then people ask, you know, when it comes to <laughs> tithing, well, what about, you know, people ask about, well, do I, when I tithe, do I tithe, tithe post-tax or pre-tax dollars? You know, like, when should I do this? So, so all my, um, the point I'm making is I don't, I don't know all the right answers in terms of how you calculate this tithe because I don't think that tithing is um, applicable in the New Testament. But just giving you my thoughts there. But I do think that if you tithe on the profit and you're running a business, it would make sense to me that you tithe um, post-tax because it's like it's not like it's like tax is, is like an expense of doing business right so it's not like you have a choice whether to pay taxes or not so um, uh, to me if a, if a business shouldn't be paying tithes on a rev on revenue they pay tithes on profit an employee to them is you know paying like your after-tax dollars it's kind of like your your profit what you take home is after you pay your your expenses for having to be able to work um, <clears throat> so there are some thoughts there <clears throat> in terms of what people think about the tithe and all the questions that get asked and the reason why all the, like I said, all these questions get asked post-tax, pre-tax, revenue, profit, whatnot, how is it calculated? Because they're trying to calculate what should be the right amount to give if they're going to give a tenth. Now, if you're only giving a tenth of the increase of the land, that's a lot easier to calculate, isn't it? Because it only applies to certain things in terms of the flock bringing forth additional, um, uh, additional sheep or the land actually bringing forth more fruit. Um, so that does actually make, and I hope I'm not confusing you guys, I'm just giving you all these thoughts here, but you know, that does actually make sense to me because you know how God, God commanded them to pay the tithe in faith, right? Knowing that, hey, if you only kept 90% of what the land and what the um, flock produced and you gave the 10% to the Levites and that would be um, there because they didn't have any land, um, then God promised that they would give them in abundance, right? So it was almost like, uh, you know, when, when you actually take raw materials like, like wool, uh, and then you um, turn it into clothing and then sell it, you're actually adding that value into that product and then selling it at a profit. But when you have sheep and you have a farm, you don't actually control the fruitfulness of that. Like that's something that God controls. God controls how fruitful your animals are going to be, right? And whether they're going to give birth. Uh, God also controls how fruitful your trees are going to be. So I, I can see it from the point of view that the tithe is technically what the land brings forth, what the animals bring forth, because it's almost like a test of faith to the Israelites that if you're willing to give God the first 10%, hey, God's going to abundantly bless. He's going to make your, your vineyard grow more than uh, that 10% that, that you gave to God. And um, it was like they, uh, they trusted that if they prioritized that giving to God, God would abundantly bless. And people tend to think of that today in terms of New Testament giving. And then when it doesn't happen, they're thinking, what's, what's going on, right? So that's, that's why I'm talking about this topic today. So that gives you a, a, a bit of idea of the tithe. Let's go to Numbers, Numbers 18. <clears throat> and we can see in Numbers 18, when the tithe, the law of the tithe was actually instituted, um, let's read here, and the Lord spake unto Aaron, thou shalt have no inheritance in their land, neither shalt thou have any part among them. I am thy part and thine inheritance among the children of Israel. So we learned that the tithe is a tenth. Now, uh, now we learn a bit more about who the tenth was actually paid to, who was given to, and the reason for it. So what God is saying here, he's talking to Aaron, the, the, the priest, right? And he's basically saying that, the, and you learn about this in the Bible, that the that there were the different tribes of Israel and all of them in the promised land, they all got an inheritance, right? All the land was divided up. Some of the tribes on one side of Jordan were given land then, but they still had to go into battle to take over the Canaanites and whatnot. And then after they took all over that, the land was divided and that's what their inheritance is. But the Levites, because they were charged to do the work of the tabernacle, 
right? The temple of, uh, or the, the tabernacle of God. It was a temple later when, when um, Solomon built it. They were charged to do the service of the tabernacle. God is saying here, well, you're not going to get an inheritance of land. And basically the tithe, which is the 10% that all of Israel will give to God, that's going to be your inheritance. And that's where we learn about how the Levites actually got their income, right? They got their income from the 10% of the tithe of the land. Verse 21, Behold, I've given the children of Levi all the tenth in Israel for an inheritance for their service which they serve, even the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. So I want you to just note there, because I'll come back to that, that you see here, that is the purpose of the tithe. The tithe was there because the Levites did not get an inheritance of land. They couldn't shepherd sheep. They couldn't plant vineyards and whatnot and have that increase. So they were tasked, and you are just going to serve in the tabernacle and not worry about that. And then the Israelites were going to give their tithe and the whole purpose of that is so that it could fund that work, that service to God um, in the tabernacle of the congregation uh, for the Levitical priesthood. Neither must the children of Israel henceforth come nigh the tabernacle of the congregation unless they bear sin and die. But the Levites <coughs> shall do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation and they shall bear their iniquity. <coughs> it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations that among the children of Israel they have no inheritance. But the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer as an heave offering unto the Lord, I have given to the Levites to inherit. Therefore I have said unto them, Among the children of Israel they shall have no inheritance. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Thus speak unto the Levites, and say unto them, When ye take of the children of Israel the tithes which I have given you from them for your inheritance, then ye shall offer up an heave offering of it for the Lord, even a tenth part of the tithe. <coughs> And this your heave offering shall be reckoned unto you as though it were the corn of the threshing floor and as the fullness of the winepress. So you see, they get that tithe, right? And then they then would tie the tenth of that to the priest. So the Levites get a tenth and then they tithe because to them, they don't have land, right? They're doing the service of the congregation, tabernacle of the congregation. So that counts to them as though they did have land. And that's why the Bible's saying here, it will be reckoned unto you as though it were the corn of the threshing floor and as the fullness of the winepress. Thus ye also shall offer an heave offering unto the Lord of all your tithes, which ye receive of the children of Israel, and ye shall give thereof the Lord's heave offering to Aaron the priest. So they would then tie the tenth of that to the priesthood, uh, which was Aaron's line. Out of all your gifts ye shall offer every heave offering of the Lord of all the best thereof, even the hallowed part thereof out of it. So that I, I touched on that verse a while back saying, you know, see when we give to God, we can learn a principle here that we ought to give our best not just give um, our worst, which is generally what happens with God, right? We keep the best for ourselves. We give our best to our family and friends and then God gets the leftovers, whether it's our materials or whether our time, that, that shouldn't be it. And that's why with the tithe, if you remember in Leviticus 27, it was the first tenth. So it talks about the first ling and it says you can't change it. It's whatever the first is that goes to God because God is always prioritized um, with the tithe and, and it should be even now we should take that principle of prioritizing God you know, with our time, with our resources. Therefore thou shalt say unto them, when ye have heaved the best <clears throat> thereof from it, then it shall be counted unto the Levites as the increase of the threshing floor and as the increase of the winepress, and ye shall eat it in every place, ye and your households. For it is your, look at this, for it is your reward for your service in the tabernacle of the congregation. So you see how it's funding the work of the tabernacle, right? and you shall bear no sin by reason of it when you have heaved from it the best of it. Neither shall you pollute the holy things of the children of Israel, lest ye die. So we can see here that the tithe was given to the Levites in place of land, right, the inheritance. Um, a tenth of the tithe was for the priests. We also see here that tithes was compulsory, right? It was commanded. You didn't have a choice whether or not to tithe or not. Um, a tenth of that, uh, you know, and we talked about, you know, how you calculate it. I'm not going to be too dogmatic on which one, but um, it was compulsory and it wasn't voluntary. But note, in the Bible, not every offering is, is tithing. You know, there's tithing, there's sin offerings, there's also free will offerings. So there's always a component of giving to God in the Old Testament that was compulsory, right? And then there was a component that was voluntary, right? Uh, and I personally believe in the New Testament, and we'll get into that, is that what's left is the voluntary because in, in Israel under the Old Testament, um, that tithe was almost like the tax, 
right? It's almost like the tax to, to run, because not only did the Levites do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, but they also were the judges as well. So it's almost like that 10% was paying for the government. Um, so there's always a compulsory component of our income and there's a voluntary component. And, and in the New Testament, you know, we, have, we, we are under a government and we are taxed. So that's almost like the tithe in the Old Testament was a tax to the nation. But then there's that voluntary giving and that's what we do in church. It's that voluntary giving of the heart, you know, a cheerful giver, um, giving to God. That's what I believe um, is left as opposed to the taxes. <clears throat> now, just here's a reason why I think um, people, people teach that tithing is still applicable today. They think it's not something that has done away with the priesthood. And I believe they can't hold to that consistently. It's like a lot of people believe that about the blessing and cursing. I don't know if you guys have heard my sermon about blessing and cursing, where the idea is they're teaching that if you obey God, then God will bless you. If you disobey God, God will curse you. Um, I don't believe that's something that is part of the new covenant. This is something that was part of the old covenant. Um, and people try and bring these things to the new covenant, to the new Testament, but they can't apply it consistently because if you are blessed by obedience to, from God, well, how obedient do you need to be? Well, according to the Bible, you need to be hundred percent obedient. Otherwise you're cursed. So then who is blessed in the new Testament? So that's not how it works. This is, this is what the old Testament was. The old Testament was the blessing and the cursing. And in the New Testament, we learn that nobody can keep the Old Testament. That's why we're under grace. And I believe even though they had different laws and different ordinances imposed on them in the Old Testament times, they, God actually dealt with them according to grace too because they, they were not perfect. They were sinners just like us, um, even though the picture is there in the Old Testament. So <clears throat> when we look at Deuteronomy 11.26, <clears throat> under the Old Testament, the concept of the blessing and cursing is taught, right? Behold, he says here, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which ye have not known. Um, so there is this blessing and curse that is part of the old covenant. <coughs> And this is why we need the new covenant. This is why we need salvation by grace because we cannot earn the blessing of God because we are all disobedient. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Um, now we'll see here in uh, Deuteronomy 27 uh, when they talked about the, the blessing and the cursing. This is where on Mount um, Gerizim and Mount Ebal they actually stood up. It says, These shall stand upon Mount Gerizim to bless the people. Verse 13, and these shall stand upon Mount Ebal to curse. These are the different tribes. And then it goes on all the different curses, right? But then we see here at the very end, verse 26, Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them, and all the people shall say amen. So you see that, that curse from God is if you do not keep the commandments, you're cursed. That's why we are all under the curse until we are saved. And this is what... Um, the New Testament teaches in Galatians 6. So this blessing and cursing, <clears throat> it was part of the old covenant, but we are no longer under law, right? We're under grace um, because Christ was um, made a curse for us. It says here, even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. So you say, if, you're, if we're trying to work our way to heaven, we're under that curse. <clears throat> For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. <clears throat> so that quote is the quote from Deuteronomy 27 that we just read. Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them. And all the people shall say, Amen. So that's what he's quoting there. But then he says, but that no man is justified by the law, right? So we're not justified by our works. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. Um, and the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, 
that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So you see how there was the blessing and the curse, but, but it's, it's, that's the old covenant. If we lived by the old covenant, we'd all be cursed. That's why the new covenant exists, so that we can be saved by grace and we are not under the curse. Now, the reason why I'm talking about this is because when people teach the law of tithing, right, usually what you'll hear in a lot of churches in order to, I guess, encourage or pr promote people to pay their tithe, which they believe is the 10% of their increase of their income to a church organization or to any organization, um, they'll say things like, well, yeah, the tithe belongs to God. And if you don't pay that tithe, then you will be robbing God, right? You'll be robbing God. And um, they get that from Malachi 3. So let's just go to Malachi 3. And I'll show you how like, they don't really apply this consistently, right? If they're going to believe that the tithe is still in effect, and therefore, the rules that are associated with the tithe are still in effect. Um, they, they, don't, they never really hold to it consistently, and this is, I'll show you why. <clears throat> so where they get it from, and, and I, I don't doubt their sincerity, right? Like, that's why I'm not saying that people that believe in tithing are just out for your money and they're just, you know, scheming and what. Probably there are people out there like that. But not everyone that believes in tithing is just, just somebody that's just out for your money. They just honestly believe that tithing is still in effect and they just believe that if you don't tithe, you're under this curse because of Malachi 3, that you're robbing God of something that doesn't actually belong to you. You're keeping something that you shouldn't be, just like the tithe was like back then, right? It's kind of like the government now. They think that, you know, if we keep our tax dollars. They're like, we're like robbing the government. Well, that's where they sort of get that idea of the taxing from. Like the Old Testament had this tax that didn't belong to them. It was God's, even though God, um, they worked to bring that forth. <clears throat> so Malachi 3, verse 8, says here, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me, but ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, <clears throat> for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now where, now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. So this is where they get this idea that if you don't um, tithe, you know, if they believe it's applicable in the New Testament, that therefore you'll be under the curse. That's why they're saying, hey, you better tithe. You know, it's not just you know, so that we can keep the lights on and everything like that, because I don't want you to be under a curse. They'll, they'll say things like that. So this, this is a passage and, and other passages like it, where they're saying, well, you, because what was happening in the Old Testament is that they were not tithing, right? They were not giving that 10% increase of the herd and of the land, uh, whether you believe it's all the increase they weren't. And then the Levites were getting um, neglected and God was angry, right? Because back then this ordinance was in place and um, he, he was angry that they were not giving um, their tithe to, to the tabernacle of the congregation for the work of God. Now, uh, the reason why I'm saying like, they don't really apply these principles consistently, right? Because they'll say things like, well, if you don't give to God, um, then, then they'll say you're cursed, right? They'll say like, you're under this curse, so you better give to God. But then it's, there, there are two sides to this equation, right? It says you're cursed with a curse, for you've robbed me, even this whole nation. And it says, bring all the sides to the storehouse. <clears throat> but he says, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. So <clears throat> on the one hand, if you don't pay your tithe, in the Old Testament, you're cursed. But if you do pay your tithe, then you're meant to be abundantly blessed, right? You're meant to, you're meant to like, he says, prove me, I will not open you the windows of heaven, pour you out a blessing. I guess he's referring to there saying like, I'm gonna open the windows of heaven and make sure that your land gets enough rain, right? Like in Hebrews, it talks about that land receiveth blessing from God, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. It's like, you know, it's like he's gonna bless your land and make it so fruitful you know, you're basically, you're better off tithing to God. Um, so they might, so you might hear, you might hear them say things like, um, you know, they'll say, oh, you know, I don't want to be cursed from God. You know, so I give, I pay my tithe. 
and, and you'll hear them say things like, you know, well, I've, you know, I've been faithfully paying my tithe, and, you know, I don't know what, and they say things like, I don't know what, but God's always taken care of me. You know, it's always like, always got, you know, enough and everything like that. Because, but that's not what actually the passage says. The passage says if you tithe, then God's going to abundantly bless. But they're not going to say things like that. They're not going to say like, well, I've tithed. That's why I'm rich. And that's why my business is doing so well. Why? Because they're going to sound like a prosperity preacher. Because this is what the prosperity pre See, it's like, it's like the independent fundamental Baptists have like taken one side of the equation to get people to pay their tithes, saying you're cursed. And then the, the, the Pentecostals, the prosperity preachers, they're focused on the other side of the equation where they're like, hey, give to God because you're going to get blessed. But nobody's taken both, right? Because both of them are, like, are in this passage because it's blessing and cursing. It's not just only blessing or only cursing. But yet they'll preach the cursing. They'll say, you know, you're cursed if you don't pay your 10% to church. And then, but then they don't want to seem like they're too much of a prosperity preacher. So they say, well, I paid my tithe and God's just given me enough. But then you have to ask the question, what about the people that pay, faithfully pay their tithe and, and don't have enough? You know, they're struggling, right? They can't even, they can't even afford their tithe because if they tithe, sometimes they can't even have any, enough money to eat because they're taxed like crazy or, you know, so much government regulation that they can't even find a job and whatnot. Um, and, and likewise, the other way, there's people that don't tithe and yet they, they do so well, right? So this is why I, I, this is one reason why I don't think this is how it works in the New Testament. You know, the New Testament is just uh, reaping and sowing uh, of what you do with your money. So your, your finances in the New Testament, you know, to me it's just, you know, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And we'll go into that more next week as I talk about the New Testament. Um, and I think another factor is, you know, just not everyone has the same talents. You know, not everyone has the same talents, abilities. Not everyone has the same privileges. You know, those of us who are born in Australia, obviously we're going to have a lot more opportunity and privilege than somebody who's born overseas in an oppressive government where, you know, they have to still farm and, they, you know, can't start their own business, don't have access to the internet and all that sort of stuff. It's going to be a lot harder for them to, to make money and whatnot. Um, but, you know, it'll all be evened out in the end at Judgment Day if we do faithfully with what we have. So that's one thing, right? One thing is those that believe in tithing, they don't really apply the blessing and the curse consistently, um, and yet they want to preach that if you don't tithe, you're under the curse, but then they don't preach that if you do tithe, that God's going to bless you financially. Um, they kind of like, you know, limit that because they know that's what the prosperity... And this is the problem. If you misapply the Old Testament, you ultimately have false doctrine, right? So they're misapplying the, the cursing and prosperity preachers are misapplying the blessing, saying if you're a Christian, you're going to be healthy, wealthy and wise and you're going to be like Joel Osteen and have straight teeth and all you got to have all the women and whatnot. I mean, that's, that's, that's the false doctrine of misapplying this old covenant and not understanding the old covenant in light of the new covenant and realizing the blessing was there. You had Israel, which pictured God's people and, you know, God did deal with them according to the Old Testament to give us an example in the New Testament. But I think ultimately he dealt with them according to grace, right? Because they didn't keep the commandments and eventually they did go into captivity, but he was merciful to them. So we see a bit of both in the Old Testament, both the, the old covenant and the new covenant throughout. And that's why we can look to the Old Testament and see pictures of the New Covenant, right? Because it's, it's both happening. And we're learning about both. <coughs> now, why do I believe that um, the tithe is no longer uh, in effect in the New Testament? And don't get me wrong, and, I, and like I said, I'll cover this next week, but I'm not saying that I don't believe in giving to church, because I do. Um, I, I do believe that you guys should, and I'm not scared to say that to you guys, that, you know, obviously you, you guys are the reason why that this, this operation keeps going, right? Like if we don't fund the work of God, then, then this church, you know, there's, there's rent to pay and all that sort of stuff, food to buy, and things like that. So don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that we don't give to God. What I am saying is we, should, we ought to give to God for the right reason. We ought to teach people to give to God with the right doctrine, Right? And then if we do that, people will have the right perspective when they give to God and it'll line up with what is taught in the New Testament. Now let's go to Hebrews 7, verse 5. Um, and I believe Hebrews, Hebrews teaches um, why we no longer um, tithe, you know, in, in terms of how it's, the tithing is done in the Old Testament, where it's, it's a compulsory sort of like a tax on you. 
uh, Hebrews 7 verse 5. And verily they that are of the sons of Levi, <coughs> who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. So it's referring back to the laws we just looked at. But he whose descent is not counted from them receiveth tithes of Abraham, and blessed, blessed him that had the promises. So it's talking about Melchizedek, which um, a lot of people believe was Jesus Christ. I personally believe it was Jesus Christ, but some people believe it wasn't. It was just a picture of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. <coughs> And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here, men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them of whom it is witness that he liveth. And I may so say, Levi also who receiveth tithes paid tithes in Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? So it's comparing here the priesthood of Jesus, which is of Melchizedek, which has nothing to do with the Levitical priesthood. So it's comparing the two priesthoods here, the priesthood that Jesus Christ is a part of, which is after the order of Melchizedek, which is this random sort of priest that appears in Genesis 14 and, and just meets Abraham and then Abraham pays a tenth of the spoils to him. <coughs> And then you have the priesthood of Aaron, right, which is the Levitical priesthood. It says, For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. So this is why there's a lot of laws in the Old Testament we no longer keep, because there's a lot of things that were imposed on them during the time of the Levitical priesthood that no longer apply to us today, because they're in the, the Levitical priesthood is no longer, right? It's done away, right? And then Jesus is now... Um, the, the, the priest of after the order of Melchizedek, and we all as believers are part of that priesthood. So there were laws to do with the priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, that are no longer in effect because there's a change in the priesthood now to Jesus Christ. That's why laws have changed because the Levitical priesthood is no longer in effect. Uh, and we learn about this two chapters later in Hebrews 9, where it says here, then verily the first covenant so the Old Testament had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. So part of the Old Testament had these, this divine service and the, the sanctuary, right, which is the, the tabernacle and the Levites serving in that worldly sanctuary. If you remember, that was the reason why the tithe was paid to them because they didn't have inheritance, they didn't have the land, so they were paid to work in that worldly sanctuary, that tabernacle. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread. <clears throat> which is called the sanctuary. After that, now you get here where it's, it, I'll, I'll skip it for sake of time, but basically it's, a, it's an explanation going into just describing, you know, when you read the Old Testament. Um, it's kind of good because when you read through the Bible a couple of times, right, you actually end up visiting back different things. It's like you read through Exodus and you read through like Joshua. And then when you read through Psalms, it sort of like recaps the stories from the Israelites coming out of Egypt. And it's like when you read through like Leviticus and you're reading through Exodus and it's telling you how the, this tabernacle is getting made. And then in Hebrews, when you read it again, it kind of gives you a summary of what it was like. So you, it's kind of like teaching again, getting you familiar with uh, <clears throat> so this is like sort of giving you a walkthrough of what the tabernacle was like. It's like the first there is the candlestick at the table. Now you can kind of picture it, right? And after the second veil, you walk through the second veil, what's there? Um, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, where it was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant, and over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. So you remember the, the Ark of the Covenant, which held the Ten Commandments and Aaron's rod that budded. Um, they kept that in there, and over the mercy seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant, you had the cherubims of glory. And I remember saying that they might have been like that, but... I, I can't remember, was it Mike? Okay, they, might be, they might be like this, over the, over the mercy seat, covering the mercy seat, <coughs> like they were in the temple. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. Um, and it goes on, the Holy Ghost is signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was yet standing. So this was all a picture 
of Jesus Christ, you know, and one day Jesus Christ going into the holy of all in heaven, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. So this is what Hebrews is teaching us here, that in the Old Testament, there was all these sacrifices and all these ordinances imposed on them. And, you know, it talks in the Old Testament about forgiving sin and everything like that. But we learn in the New Testament that it was just a figure of things to come. It was just, it was a, a worldly thing that was representing what was actually in heaven. And Jesus Christ was the actual sacrifice to take away the sins. Because, you know, it's the sacrifices and gifts that they did in the Levitical priesthood that, you know, didn't um, do anything for them, right? making them perfect. It says, in which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation, right? So these things, these carnal ordinances and divine washings, this service of the tabernacle was imposed on them until the time of reformation. And what is that time? Verse 11 tells us, but Christ being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. So you see here how, like in Hebrews 7, when it says there's a change in the priesthood, that's why there's a change in the law, that's why those laws to do with the Levitical priesthood were only temporary, because when Christ came, right, um, they, the priesthood has changed, therefore the laws have changed, and that's why there's no longer a worldly sanctuary, right? Now there's a tabernacle that's not made with hands. Um, and then it goes on to say, you know, how Jesus is gonna be our high priest. and He's actually the, the real thing to what the Old Testament pictured, right? So the Old Testament pictured, Je the, the, you know, Old Testament had this high priest going into this actual sanctuary, and then we had tithes being paid to make all that work. But in the New Testament, that whole system is now gone, right? And Jesus is our high priest and he's in the actual real temple in heaven. Um, <clears throat> now, this is mainly um, uh, the reason why I believe it no longer applies, right? Because if you remember in Numbers 18, the reason why a tithe was even commanded to begin with in the Old Testament, it was to fund the service of the tabernacle and that service is no longer existing, right? And people might say, well, it's because, you know, now the, the, the new tabernacle is the church, right? And, and, the, and the bishops and the deacons are now the priests. But the bishops and deacons of the New Testament church are not the New Testament priests, right? It's not like in Catholicism or in Orthodoxy where, you know, you know I'm meant to be like this priest. And that's why they're like that, right? Because they're trying to imitate that Old Testament tabernacle, and that's why they make these big buildings that are really fancy and all that sort of stuff, because the temple was really fancy, and they believe that they are continuing this, this priesthood uh, on from Aaron. <clears throat> but that's what makes us different as Baptists, right? Because Baptists don't believe in the, the, the priesthood, the Aaronic priesthood, the Levitical priesthood is done away. We, are, we believe in the priesthood of the believer, that every believer is a priest. So this idea that you're still paying tithes, tithes are still in effect, but tithes were paid to the Levitical priests. And you say, well, bishops and deacons are the new priests. You have no basis for that because we are not the new priests. And if the tithes are for the priests in the New Testament, then it shouldn't only be the bishops and deacons partaking of the tithe, right? If that's how you're going to apply it. That's not the reason why I believe bishops and deacons have the authority to be paid by the local church, but I'm just saying, if you're going to use the doctrine of tithing from the Old Testament to support your practice, you just come into these, into these problems. So <clears throat> let me show you here in 1 Peter 2.9, why we believe in the priesthood of the believer. It says here, but ye are a chosen generation, right? So it's talking about believers, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Uh, another passage in Revelation 1, 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Right, so that's us, our salvation. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So you see how you had... Um, 
Aaron, you know, you had the, the high priest and all the priests in the Aaronic priesthood. And then in the New Testament, you have Jesus. Jesus is the high priest, right? He's our high priest that entered in once with his own blood. Right? He was also the sacrifice um, to sprinkle his blood on the mercy seat in heaven. And we as believers are the, the priesthood <coughs> that the Old Testament pictured. So they don't really apply that consistently, right? If the tithes are paid to the priests, well, then everyone really should be partaking of the tithes, not just those that work, um, uh, that, are, that are the bishops and the deacons, because they're not, they're not the New Testament priests. They are the New Testament overseers within the local church, which is a new um, organization that has been established in the New Testament. Now, the last point I want to talk about is, well, pe people might say, well, tithing, because we went to Leviticus 27, we went to Numbers 18, and I showed you, hey, this is when the commandment to tithe was actually instituted and why, where people actually get this um, say that, saying that it's compulsory, right, in Numbers 18. But then people will say things like, yeah, but even before Numbers 18, even before <clears throat> Leviticus 27, people were already tithing. You know, there's, there's examples of people tithing. And the three examples that they might give that I've heard from one person, um, they'll go to Genesis 4 where they say, Cain and Abel, in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground and offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the first things of his flock and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. So they say here, see, Abel's already tithing, right? He's giving his first to God. Well, here, first of all, it doesn't say that that one animal that Abel brought was a tenth. So I don't know if you can really use this as, as a tithe, but let's say he, that was his tenth and he brought the first and people will say that's why God was angry with Cain. <clears throat> maybe because he wasn't tithing, you know, maybe he wasn't giving the tenth. I personally think the reason why God was angry with Cain is because Cain just, Cain didn't bring his first, he didn't bring his best. Um, Cain brought forth, it says Cain brought of the fruit of the ground and offering unto the Lord. So he just brought some of his stuff to God. But Abel, it's, it, it, it specifically says that he brought the firstlings of his flock. I don't think particularly, you know, because you can give an offering that's not an animal sacrifice to God. So I don't think it's necessarily God was angry with him because he was bringing an offering that wasn't an animal sacrifice. Uh, I personally think it's because, you know, Cain didn't bring his first fruits, whereas Abel did. He brought his firstlings and that's why God was more ple pleased with Abel than he was with Cain, because it's like Cain was giving him the leftovers, but Abel was giving the best, <clears throat> the best to God. So there's one example, Genesis 4. Another example is Genesis 14, where you have Abraham paying tithes to Melchizedek. It says, and he blessed him and said, blessed be Abraham of the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the most high God, um, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. <coughs> So I don't doubt that Abraham gave him, gave tithes to Melchizedek, but some of the things you have to think about is, well, first of all, Abraham was not commanded to give tithes to Melchizedek. It was something he did voluntarily, right? Whereas when people teach tithes now, it's not voluntary. You're robbing God if you didn't give him tithes. So would Abraham have been robbing Melchizedek if he didn't give him tithes? And second of all, he gave him only a tithe, like a tenth of the spoils of that war. He didn't give him, he, he wasn't paying tithes just all the time, a tenth to um, Melchizedek, right? So um, there's a few holes there. The last one they'll go to is um, Jacob. Um, and it says here, and Jacob awaked out of his sleep and he said, surely the Lord is in this place and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, how dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it upon, up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will put me bread to eat, raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that, I, that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. So I'll say, oh, see, there's Jacob giving a tenth to God, right? So he, but see, again, 
it's not like they were keeping the commandment of the tithe because it wasn't until this point that Jacob even decided, I'm going to give a tenth to God. But he wasn't giving a tenth to God before, right? Because if he was already giving a tenth to God, what's the big deal about him saying, well, if you do all this for me, I'm going to give a tenth to you. It's like, well, you already meant to give a tenth to me, right? So <clears throat> he obviously wasn't giving a tenth to him, but also this is not how the tithes work. A tithe is not like, hey, God, like, I'm going to, if you do this for me, then I'm going to give you my tithe. Right? Because in Malachi, it's like if you don't give God the tithe, you're under a curse, you're robbing God because you're keeping something that doesn't belong to you. Right? So you see how like, th these are not examples of tithing. This is just examples of people giving a tenth. So yeah, I don't, I don't have a problem with people saying, well, in the New Testament, tithes don't exist, but we still have to give to God. You know, what's a reasonable percentage? You know, tenth is a reasonable percentage. You know, the tithe or the tenth, they're giving a tenth. You know, that's probably a reasonable percent percentage of everyone to give a tenth to God and then that will fund the work of God. The difference is, though, it's, it's voluntary in the New Testament. Nobody's forcing you to give. You can give more if you want, give less if you want. You're just going to reap more or less. In the Old Testament, you have the tithe. It's not doesn't even belong to you. You're robbing God if you keep it. And if you keep it, you're cursed. But if you, if you give it to God, then he's going to bless you. Now, the other problem <clears throat> with trying to go to these, there's already holes in them, right, of, of, the, of the, the fact that they're not tithing. They're just giving a tenth to God voluntarily. But the other thing is, um, if, if I'm going to use the reasoning that just because something was done before the Mosaic law, therefore we should still do it in the New Testament, um, well, we, we can't use these as examples. We can't say, well, they did it before uh, the Mosaic law, they tithe, therefore we should do it in the New Testament. Because they also, if, if you remember, <coughs> all these examples, right, all the people, Abel, he gave an uh, animal offering to God. You know, we don't do that anymore, right? The reason why we don't do it is because the Levitical priesthood is done away. So we don't offer animals to God. You don't come to church with your lamb and, you say, and then we're burning stuff here and, and, you know, and you know, I'm going into a, a veil and all that sort of stuff. Like, you know, we're not the Mormon church. Yeah, the Mormon does that, right? But um, so that, we don't do that anymore. But all these guys did, like Abraham, Jacob, you know, this is even before the Levitical priesthood. They were offering animals to God. So if I'm going to use the reasoning, if somebody's going to say, well, you should tithe because Abraham, Jacob, and Abel supposedly tithe, therefore tithing is still for the New Testament, then why don't we still offer animal sacrifices? Because they did that too, right? If I'm going to be consistent and say, well, whatever they did before the Levitical priesthood, we're going to do in the New Testament, then we should also be offering God animals and offering, uh, you know, offering up burnt offerings, which you know, um, Abraham did. Remember, he had to go up to the mountain and offer his son, and then he offered the ram as a burnt offering. So <clears throat> next week, we will go into principles of giving in the New Testament and actually look at what the New Testament teaches about giving um, so that you have the right perspective, and you'll see the difference. But what I just wanted to explain today is the law of the tithe, what it was, why it existed, and why I believe it's no longer applicable in the New Testament. So, like I said, it's not that I'm against giving. You know, I don't want anyone to hear this sermon and just think, oh, Victor doesn't think people should give to church. No, I do want people to give to churches. I do want people to fund the work of God, but I want them to do it for the right reasons, with the right perspective, and I also want the preachers out there that are teaching people to give to God, that they're teaching the right doctrine as opposed to teaching the doctrine of tithing, which is something that was part of the Levitical priesthood. All right, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord for your word and um, uh, Lord there's a lot to study and um, I just pray Lord that as people come to your house that they uh, learn of your word and um, thank you Lord that we have your word today we don't live in a day where it's hard to get um, and I pray Lord that you would help us to realize that that you know the fact that we've been given more that Lord you require more from us so I pray Lord that you would help us to not be taken away with the cares of this world and our uh, Lord help us to put you first, um, just like the principles we learned from tithing in the Old Testament. So um, we thank you, Lord, and pray that you bless the rest of our time together. Thank you for everything. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.